I was uh, very surprised. I, I knew nothing about him as well. Uh, I, I think I had just kind of assumed that that he was a uh, he, he came and went around the turn of the century, the nineteenth mm. into the twentieth century, and was very surprised that uh, you know he actually uh, was involved. I mean, I, geez, I, I, I wouldn't have ever guessed that he had been to New York even, which is why you called him a failed immigrant. I think because. Right. He came and uh, he put. Uh, you, you tell the story in the film that he uh, he had two shows on Broadway simultaneously, and they both miserably failed. That's right. Uh, Actually, not on Broadway, the Yiddish oh, theater. Yiddish theater. I'm sorry. But uh, but the Yiddish theater at that point, it, Broadway in some ways metaphorically is not at all wrong because at that point in New York, the Yiddish theater was an, an enormously vibrant, energetic scene with many theaters, extremely mm -hmm. popular entertainment. So. So, yeah, I mean, he had thought he was at that point, by the time he came here, the greatest Jewish writer alive, the most popular Jewish writer alive, certainly, and expected to make a great, great splash in America and then fell into the faction-ridden waters of American Jewish culture. And we can talk about that more if you want. Yeah, I actually know a little bit about the uh, Jewish, uh, the Yiddish theater from that time. I did uh, a biography of a comic book artist named Will Eisner, and his dad... Mm. Uh, his dad was a scene painter in the old Yiddish theaters, and uh, huh. I know in the book we talk about a couple of the uh, the Yiddish actors who later became very well known uh, with Americanized names. And mm. Paul, not Paul Muni, Paul, Paul Muni. Muni, Paul Muni, yeah, 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 uh, was was Ridley one of the guys. Wiesenfall or Wiesenfield yeah. or something. Yeah, that's right. I was, yeah, I, the, I was going to reach for the book, and then you you named him, so you saved yeah. me. <laughs> I did. I actually did a review of uh, a, a, a book uh, on the Yiddish theater a few years ago, and it really is remarkable. I mean, that what you're talking about the influence, even though the Yiddish theater is long gone, with with one very notable exception, at least in New York, of the folks being a national Yiddish theater, which has been in constant operation for I think a century now. But obviously, the Yiddish theater scene as we know it, it has long gone. But its tentacles, its roots, its its branches into American culture. Are, are deep and wide. I mean, uh, this review I almost wanted, or my title for it wasn't, wasn't picked up by the editor, was Marlon Brando's Yiddish accent. <laughs> because Marlon Brando's teacher, the woman he revered, Stella Adler, was the daughter of the great actor of the Yiddish theater, Jacob Adler. So it's, it's a really interesting story, only partially known. Hmm. Is, uh, is Shalom Aleichem one of the... Uh most quintessential of uh, these Jewish authors because of his stories, uh, the universality of them, or something else? Uh, yeah. You know, I, what's interesting about Shalom Aleichem, and, and maybe, or maybe I should say this is not interesting at all, because it, defer, it defines a great writer, was that he was at one and the same time the quintessentially Jewish author and capturing some aspect of Jewishness in a way that I think no one else has captured in quite the same way. There was a, uh, a, a, a poll among uh, writers and academics of the great, the, the great Jewish book, and it was, it was Tevye the Dairyman, the Tevye the Dairyman stories. But at the same time that he was the quintessential Jewish author because he was a great author, he's also a quintessentially universal author. Mm -hmm. And so he combines both of those things in the same way you could say of a Tolstoy or, or, or Melville or, or whoever you would, you would want to describe as someone who's both a great national author and yet someone who's, who's part of world literature. Are his uh, stories taught in uh, high school or college English the way some other people of his era who were not Yiddish or Jewish authors uh, are, uh, you know, my gut, I don't know for sure, but my gut feeling is no. I mean, so far as I know, I think the only curriculum he would be taught in would be if you were in a college, maybe a, a college course on Jewish literature or on Yiddish literature. Uh, there was a Yiddish school system for a while. But interestingly, or, or, or not, Yiddish literature has been marginalized, and it's been marginalized uh, not only by non-Jews, but by Jews as well. It really, it's, it's something that um, has not crossed over. And the only way it really did cross over for, more, for all intents and purposes was through something like Fiddler on the Roof. Hmm. Um, but whereas a, 
a Kafka or a Saul Bellow in America, Kafka obviously in Europe, and Czechoslovakia, and et cetera. Um, whereas they're both world off, you know, on the world scene and, and part of their national literatures. Yiddish literature really was seen, I think, because it was a, a literature of a people at the time who were poor and essentially dis disenfranchised. It, it didn't have the, the reputation ultimately. And one of the things, and I'm only a small part of this because there are many other people who have been doing this for years, but one of the things I would like the film to do is not only bring more people to Sholem Aleichem, but to, to many of his fellow Yiddish authors who are, are, are great authors in their own right. Hmm. Well, uh, let's take a uh, quick break. This is Bob Adelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media interview with documentary filmmaker Joseph Dorman, whose new film is Sholem Aleichem, Laughing in the Darkness, and we'll be right back. 